continuing with the Gen Con theme month with a review of a second documentary about tabletop RPGs with uh, Secrets of Blackmore Volume 1, a documentary about Dave Arneson's contributions to the dawn of role-playing and the creation of Dungeons & Dragons. For the sake of full disclosure, I backed the Kickstarter for this documentary, but I feel that that doesn't disqualify me with from being able to evaluate it. But it is worth saying up front, nonetheless, just for get to cover all my bases. For those who are unfamiliar, Blackmore was the role-playing game campaign played by Dave Arneson's gaming group in the 1970s, leading up to the publication of Dungeons and Dragons. Often described as the first fantasy campaign, this Blackmore game, the start of it, predates the publication or even some of the earliest playtesting of the original Dungeons and Dragons rules. And we're talking the set known as the Brown Box, or maybe the Wood Grain Box, or the Three Pamphlets, depending on who you ask. In particular, the overwhelming focus of this documentary is less on how Blackmoor became the Dungeons and Dragons rules, and more on how the Blackmoor campaign got started, with a heavy focus on what Blackmoor evolved from, the Bronstein Games. Now, if you watched my review of the book Playing at the World, you may remember that the Bronstein games, which, by the way, this is explained in the documentary as well, were a series of miniatures wargaming campaigns where rather than all of the players each being generals of individual armies with conflicts being played out exclusively in the form of miniatures battles, they were instead significant actors in and around the fictional German town of Bronstein during the Napoleonic Wars with some of the players, yes, being a general of a couple armies, but also the town priest or the burgomaster or the head of the local college or even the more visible sort of ringleader of a particularly notable group of students. These games and the variations thereof, combined with uh, Gary Gygax's chainmail rules, ended up becoming Dave Arneson's Blackmore campaign. Now, the presentation of the documentary is great, combining interview footage um, with various members of the Bronstein and Blackmore group with more recent games being played using those rules, either with current sessions by the Blackmore group or uh, footage from Gary Khan of people playing in a Bronstein game or that sort of thing. Also combined with... Um, inclusions of various notes uh, from the various groups in question, and even some very nice graphics come sort of combining different dungeon level maps, um, showing them stacked on top of each other and that sort of thing. It is a really solid visual style, particularly with the like, graphics around the dungeon maps that pops and brings out the sense of imaginations poured into these notes. And also by showing people playing in these games in the present day shows that these were fun games to be in and that it's not just a, oh, it's a thing that people enjoy doing because of the novelty thereof. Now, to be up front, or, or to be frank, I should say, it is, though, a documentary that starts on a bad foot, starting with Robert Kurtz, a TSR alum, and indeed someone who's actually close to Gygax, um, basically giving a pitch that Gary Gygax did all the work for uh, Dungeons and Dragons and, Gyga and Gygax didn't do crap. The Arnesonian argument of the Arnesonian versus Gygaxian crowd. Now, later in the documentary, we have other members of the ver of these various groups in question, like the Blackmore group, who dispute this and indeed find the whole argument to be um, basically obnoxious and a waste in time and, dis and a takes away from the memory of both people, Arneson and Gygax alike. But the inclusion of these statements is so far from Kuntz's initial statements, um, like at the very end of the documentary, almost two hours later, that it feels odd that they're included. It's almost like an afterthought that only came about because the interviewer asked them the subject's questions that they thought might lead to similar statements only to not get the results they answer results they expected 
and decided to put them together towards the end, even though it like undermined what they thought was their th- what they thought was the thesis that they were building towards. Similarly, there are some grognard-esque comments in the documentary, as within the voiceover itself. And so it's coming from an editorial perspective. Slamming Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition for not including Arneson or Gygax's names on the cover of the game when... Um, look, I'm going to be blunt with you. Nobody's names on the cover of the book. Um, there are complete author credits on the inside credit page. And... Both Arneson and Gygax's names are there. In fact, actually, let me flip to that page real quick. Yep, here we go. Yeah, everybody's on there. So, you know, um, saying, oh, they, they're slighted Arnis and Gygax by not mentioning, by not putting them on the cover. Um, like, it, nobody's on the cover. Nobody got snubbed in that regard. Everybody got, like, Gygax and Arneson are put in positions of honor, honor on, the, in, on the credits page. And then with the additional contributors, as far as the earlier, earliest members of some of these gaming groups are on the and the rules contributors and co-authors and that sort of thing put on there after it, along with the authors of previous editions of the game, including revisions like the Menser box set and that sort of thing. So, you know, um, um, saying, oh, Arnis saying, saying that they're, that they're not appropriately crediting Gygax and Arnis and, it's like saying that the Marvel movies don't credit Stan Lee, like like the Marvel movies, particularly like the early phases, didn't credit Stan Lee because they didn't put his name at the very beginning of the film. Like didn't do Stan Lee presents um, Iron Man two. Like, like they didn't put anybody's like they put like director names and that sort of thing. But it's like Stan Lee didn't make that version of like didn't write that movie. Um, and the same way Gary Gygax, Dave Arneson didn't write, didn't write the fifth edition of Dungeons and Dragons. It's a very misleadingly worded grognardy, grognardy statement. My other real complaint other than that is the sole interview suspect subjects in the documentary our first-hand sources, members of the Blackmore and Bronstein groups, which is fine. They are very informative and helpful, give a lot of useful information, and share interesting and engaging stories. And it's interesting to hear them talk and share what they know. We don't get any expert sources to give a larger context outside of voiceover, written from and presented by Paul Stormberg. But Stormberg himself does not necess- does not appear on camera. And he's a very knowledgeable person on the topic. He runs the Collector's Trove, an auction house that sells material related to the history of the tabletop gaming field. He is the co-host of a doc of a currently running podcast doing the biography of Gary Gygax. But uh, the point is with that podcast, Stormberg is identified, his credentials are stated, and he is on camera or on microphone. We get to hear his own words spoken. At, by him and presented as him as a as a authoritarian as a authoritative voice um that is identified as who that person is that is not the case in the presentation of this documentary we nor do we have any other authoritative voices who could have presented valuable information and insight no john peterson author of playing of the world no shannon Applecline author of Designers and Dragons, all of whom have also done their own exhaustive research on this topic and have written their own books on this matter as well. In fact, Peterson honestly wrote the book literally on this era of the history of role-playing. That's what playing at the world is. And and having him chip in his thoughts... um, give some valuable contents, particularly to help moderate the biases that the first-hand sources, 
like, for example, Rob Kurtz has that would have that would make this more valuable to a degree. Because as anyone who's done research, like serious research or taken classes in research will tell you, primary sources come with their own biases, and you have to keep that in mind when you use them. So, as far as in isolation goes, I'm hit or miss on this documentary. In combination with playing at the world, on the other hand, I think it is a valuable addition to that. Playing at the world is a bone dry read. There are chunks of it that are really engaging and like, engaging and educational and insightful when it comes to reading about the various influences that led to the it led to the evol evolution of wargaming as a whole. But I think having this like this documentary and then like reading playing at the world coming to this documentary with the not with the information and knowledge that you've learned from that book helps illuminate this documentary a great deal and then in turn help, helps kind of pick up some of the points and bring them into a brighter relief that playing at the world doesn't or, or, or as far as it comes to rent comes to overcoming some of the presentational shortcomings of playing at the world. Playing at the world is a very, very academic text. It is not quite like reading a textbook, but it is comparable. I enjoyed reading through it because of my passion for the material, but it is not, for lack of a better term, as riveting a read as, for example, Designers and Dragons. I I liked playing out the world enough that if like like I'd pick up the audiobook out if there was one because I enjoyed the book because I enjoyed the information that was contained within it. I would not recommend it to others in isolation as an audiobook. The same way that I would with say Designers and Dragons because Shannon Applecline, author of Designers and Dragons, has a voice that is that is more willing to spice up, not say spice up the material, but provide a narrative and flavor and depth to the material. So, in the same context, this documentary provides a depth of flavor to the material contained in Playing at the World. But, in presented as it is, it is less, it is not as useful as in, as an introduction to the material, it provides useful notes, but it tells an interesting story, but there is a broader context that is missing, and it ends up grinding some unpleasant axes that do not need to be ground. Now, to put it that way. So, now, currently, uh, if you did not pick this, pick up the uh, documentary previously, either do a physical, previous physical release, or because you backed the Kickstarter, it is available currently digitally, digitally on the Amazon Video Store, and there will be a link to get it in the doobly doo. Buying anything through that affiliate link helps to support the show. Um, you can pick up the documentary. You don't. You could choose not to. You could pick up something else instead. I'm not your dad. Next week or next time, we shall our our final Gen Con tie-in will be another documentary that I um, helped kickstart, but this one more artistically engaged inclined with the documentary Eye of the Beholder the history of the art of Dungeons and Dragons.
Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe. And also consider backing my Patreon. Patreon backers get episodes up to one week early of this show and any future Let's Plays. Also, please consider backing my coffee. Uh, toss me a few bucks, also helps support the show, and it's not a monthly obligation or anything like that. <laughs>